when you look at a DAP, when you think personally about your DAP, maybe, it's like your ethical financial home, right? It's the place where you are reflecting your hopes for society beyond your own personal gain. Welcome to the Regeneration Will Be Funded. This is a show about regenerative finance. We are exploring pathways to a life-affirming economy. Today's guest is Robbie Heger. He is the president and CEO of Endowment. Endowment is a DAF provider. And viewers of the show will know we've had several guests exploring these topics around donor advised funds including recently Nicole Taylor from Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Alex Gear from Daffy, Cheryl Spain from the Gift Trust in New Zealand, Brad Lebo from Earthshare, and multiple others. Really, the through line of our inquiry here is figuring out how do we get more money off the sidelines into causes that matter, and specifically also how do we get more funds into environment, climate, these types of themes. So very excited to sit down with Robbie, who has more of a digitally native and crypto native approach. Endowment is not uh, something I'm as familiar with. So very excited to have you on the show and to dive into it. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And the space is beautiful. Cool. And so maybe just starting from the top, what is Endowment? And can you take us through a bit of the journey? Sure. Um, endowment is a almost four, almost four years old. Cool. We started in October of 2020, and it is a community foundation. It's a donor advice fund provider, like you mentioned. We like to think of ourselves as the Internet's community foundation. Uh, generally, a community foundation is centered around region or around a faith or around a topic of interest. Mm. Um, we are based around a community that lives on the Internet, that invests on the Internet, that gathers on the Internet, that creates on the Internet. Um, our goal is to build the community foundation that will serve the sort of Cambrian explosion of use cases and economic activity that's happening online. Mm, great. And so what does that look like in practice? Uh, what's different about the infrastructure that you're building? The primary difference about the infrastructure that we've built at Endowment is that the underlying grant management system Mm. the fund management system, the grant making apparatus and investing apparatus for the donor advised fund platform mm. exists entirely in smart contracts on chain. Wow. So we've written a protocol effectively for charitable giving, mm -hmm. uh, for, for tax mitigation and tax exempt charitable giving on chain. So you can take digital assets, um, but also traditional assets and give them as is like you would with any donor advised fund, take the tax deduction at the time of, of the gift mm -hmm. and invest those donated assets over time into investments that are values aligned with yourself or um, even just to grow your impact and the amount of money that you can give away to nonprofits over time. Mm -hmm. um, donor advised funds are exciting because they allow you to kind of divorce the financial wellness, financial planning decision mm -hmm. of how much to give in a given calendar year from the impact allocation decision right. of where do we want to put this money to work mm -hmm. and how do we want to put this money to work? Do we want to do impact loans? Do we want to do impact investing? Do we want to give it all away to a specific initiative or a specific researcher at a university? Um, there are so many ways to action a DAF portfolio into a community. Um, and we really focus on trying to be as flexible as possible right? because that's the expectation of the modern investor is that they hold some mix of traditional and digital assets or alternative mm -hmm. assets, privately held companies. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one of those assets might be better situated for the financial mitigation tax mitigation plan yeah um, but you want the full breadth of options for growing that impact and granting that impact globally mm -hmm. um, without having to go to a different platform or without having to be 
burdened with bringing assets from outside the traditional finance financial system back into the traditional financial right. system right. or vice versa. Right. So donor advised funds being the fastest growing segment of philanthropy, they've yeah. been booming. And a big part of that appeal is you have your kind of, you know, out of the box private foundation where you don't have to do all the administrative overhead and you also get to pace your giving over time. Right. Whereas you can do all of the deduction at once. So if I made a hundred dollars of income, I can give away 50, that 50 becomes a deduction on my tax return. Now that 50 is in my donor advised fund and I can give that, I can give $10 this year and then another 10 next year and another 10 the year after that. Um, or maybe I have a recurring giving plan and I'm just giving $20 a month into the donor advised fund and distributing 20 and I'm just using it as kind of my foundation out of a box. But what you're talking about with all these different types of assets, because I may have stocks, I may have bonds, I may have crypto, I may have artwork, I may have different types of things that right. have financial value. In particular, U.S. jurisdiction and presumably others that I'm not as mm -hmm. much familiar with, not New Zealand, by the way, um, they will give you uh, essentially a deduction for the amount that you're donating, but you might have had an, a, a significant appreciation of that. And by giving the asset itself, you no longer have to pay the tax on the appreciation. So for example, if I bought $100 of NVIDIA stock, now it's worth 1000 If I have to sell the NVIDIA stock, I have to pay gains on the 900 Correct. pay taxes. But if I just give the NVIDIA stock to my DAF, then I get the thousand dollar deduction, but I didn't have to pay gains on the nine hundred, and so they have. And correct me anywhere where I'm misspeaking, but you you essentially have a really strong tax incentive alignment around charitable giving, and this is part of the reason donor advised funds have ballooned in terms of total assets under management. H how did I do with that description? You did pretty <laughs> good. It only took me 10 interviews uh, to get no, there. No, no, you did uh, pretty good. You did pretty good. Um, hats off to you. You mm. clearly uh, have been talking with some DAF people. <laughs> um, you know, we like to think of DAFs as the vehicle for charitable givers who are savvy, mm. right? Like who are thinking deeply about the economic implications of what they give, when they give, mm -hmm. how they give, where they give to, mm -hmm. right? Right. All of those decisions are generally being worked on between an individual and their financial advisor. Right. And really, like, the, the education gap is generally covered mm. by the financial advisor educating the client about, oh, well, if you gave to a DAF here, your income is such that you could mark, you know, you could deduct the full value of this gift without hitting the cap on mm -hmm. how much you can deduct from your AGI. And so I'm going to help you make sure that we take the thing that has the lowest cost basis, right? right that has the highest tax obligation. We're going to give that. And then we're going to liquidate some other stuff that mm -hmm. has low tax obligation. So you net out yep. with your minimal tax payment. Yep. And we really see as the world becomes more friendly to alternative assets, mm -hmm. crypto being one of them, mm -hmm. that the investor is getting much more savvy about the tax implications of what they're investing in because it's not happening through their financial advisor. And they get this right. wake up call right. where it's like, oh, yeah. I took some crypto off the table yeah. and now apparently I owe this much money. Yeah. And what, do, what can I do before the year is up to try and offset that right. and yeah, you know, enter endowment, right? Right. And so we do a lot of education work around that. Your description is largely correct. There is some specifics about tax brackets and about how right. much of your AGI you can deduct depending on what you're giving. Um, there's a few specifics there about your own personal financial situation. Right. And, and that's really what I'm driving at when I say, you know, that we're divorcing the concept of I have to decide where I allocate to mm. from a philanthropic standpoint right. at the same moment that I am also giving and making the personal financial decision yeah. about what's the right thing for me to give. Right. And if you don't get the opportunity to separate those, right. Right, what is exciting about DAFs is that you get the opportunity to separate those two moments and make the right decision for you yep. and then go and think critically and take time and have options for how you 
give back to the world totally now that you've made that optimized decision about your own personal finances yeah so my understanding is that endowment has a dual structure can you take mm -hmm. us through a bit of how that works sure endowment is both uh is is really comprised of two businesses um and it's important both from a legal and from an operational perspective that mm. we treat them as like very separate businesses. Mm. Um, and so we've put in a lot of work, a lot of time, um, and actually have built two separate teams that have two fully separate payroll apparatuses, benefits packages, mm. you know, um, places of business. Mm. We spend a lot of time and energy really creating this separation between the nonprofit entity mm and the software development firm Got it. and this was something that we got advice on very early on and we're very grateful that mm. our legal team encouraged us to do this because i don't think we would be where we are today mm. without having set up this dual entity architecture so at its core uh is the technology company it, it's almost like a hub and spoke kind of philosophy around mm. how we've set up the value of the technology against the role and purpose of the nonprofit administrator entity. Got it. But effectively, what you have is a technological protocol mm -hmm. that is a series of smart contracts and front end interfaces and uh, different support apparatus and different monitoring services. Mm -hmm. All of the things that are about making sure the website's up and running, mm -hmm. that's about making sure that the technology works. Mm -hmm. that is support for the nonprofit entity, which is the administrator of the donor advised funds. Got it. So crucial to any donor advised fund provider is mm -hmm. that the charitable chain of custody be kept intact. Right. That when you give the asset, you're donating it to a nonprofit organization. Right. And at that moment, at that moment you're getting a tax receipt for that donation. Mm -hmm. It's got to go into the hands of a nonprofit and it can't leave that ha the hands of that nonprofit unless it's going to another nonprofit down right. the line. Right. And really, that's the function of endowment.org. Endowment.org mm. is there to be the donor advised fund provider. Got it. It is there to engage with donors, to solicit new donations, mm -hmm. to do due diligence on grant making activity that's happening in the protocol, mm -hmm. to do uh, anti-money laundering and OFAC checks against where donated capital is coming into all of the compliance work mm -hmm. that goes into administering a donor advised fund is happening at endowment.org. Got it. And at endowment.tech, we see the job as quite different. The job is to advance the technology and build the strongest set of tools for tax mitigation mm. that leverage an on-chain environment as its underlying set of infrastructure, as the rails mm -hmm. that are powering the technology. Right. And that leads us to sort of two very different teams with two very different responsibilities and, and with experiences that are, that are very, very different. And it's been... <laughs> More responsibility for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I am one of two people who are employed at both entities. I um, and I have very different jobs at both entities. And mm. I wind up working as if I have two jobs, because I do. <laughs> um, and what we are building from a technological perspective has value as an example for transparent custodianship of tax tax special treatment dollars, special treatment dollars is mm -hmm. what I'll say, compliance mm -hmm. intensive dollars. Mm -hmm. and the donor advised fund just happens to be the lowest hanging fruit for applying that technology that we built. Yeah. And so, you know, when I talk about sort of like the hub and spoke model that we think of, yeah. you know, endowment.tech is, is looking and saying, okay, we have this special tax treatment vehicle of a donor advised fund. Yeah. But there are other kinds of special tax treatment vehicles that when you marry them with an administrator, mm. you can provide a very specialized service to a user. Mm -hmm. um, generally, that allows them to put money aside for their family or for their community mm -hmm. or for the global community. Um, and 
recognize some benefit to their own tax situation as a result. Mm-hmm. And in a world where more and more investments are self-directed, yeah. the value of a financial institution starts to circle around the compliance apparatus that you're providing and That's the right. specialized tax treatment that you can give to people That's right. for the services and the vehicles that you have at your disposal. Yeah. And so in some ways we see this as like what, as an answer to what does the modern financial institution look like? You know, yep. there's a lot of people out there who are saying, you know, we're going to go build Fidelity mm-hmm. or we're going to go build, you know, the equivalent of Pershing or BNY Mellon or, um, you know, any of these major, major financial, Schwab, any of these major, major financial institutions. And the question is like, what sticks in a world that um, assets are tokenized, mm-hmm. where alternative assets are just as prevalent as traditional assets? where transparency and online accessibility are table stakes. Um, You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to Mm -hmm. take the foundation that we've built at the technological foundation that we've built at Endowment Tech and apply it in other tax mitigation vehicles while continuing to provide this community foundation for the internet for the internet native investor right that will blossom into something much much larger than i think we can really dream mm. of and imagine right now like um one of my favorite statistics is that you know multiple of the top 10 nonprofits by size by asset center management uh, in the united states are Fidelity Charitable and Schwab Charitable and the National Philanthropic Trust. And, you know, there are these huge grant-making foundations. Mm -hmm. And we see the opportunity at endowment.org to try and say, what would an institution like that look like if it was born in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And how would it back into a similar set of services? How would it build a brand around being slightly more connected to the human and slightly more connected to the individual Mm -hmm. um, rather than the institution. Um, So there's, there's lots of ways that we're hoping to experiment with that and Mm -hmm. play with that. But that's sort of the dual entity architectures. You have the nonprofit and you have the tech company and they also make money in different ways, which we can talk about if you want. Yeah. um, I have so many questions now. I mean, this is really exciting. Let's, let's just linger on endowment.org for a moment. Sure. Um, one theme that we've been hearing from other conversations is really around what you said about, you know, you're divorcing that initial donation within the grant making allocation mm-hmm. decision mm-hmm. Um, in, a, in a kind of utilitarian on chain, you know, tech forward type of approach. What are the risks around losing some of that relationship management or that community engagement of trying to bring nonprofits into the donor experience or what are you seeing and kind of what's your thesis around how to ensure that people um, are still moving the funds essentially that it's not just being parked in the DAF um, it, or is it yeah because I, I imagine that kind of the on-chain environment and from what I've experienced on your website like you can kind of get rid of a lot of the intermediating functions and make this really efficient and, and smooth and clean but does that risk abstracting or depersonalizing kind of the relationship that people have to the nonprofits or yeah, what does that provoke? You know, I think something that we spend a lot of time trying to solve for is creating open lines of communication between a grant recipient and the underlying donor advisor. Mm. It's, not really surprising in hindsight once you hear it, but it is definitely um, an area for innovation that has been sort of put to the side in the name of efficient operations for large community foundations. Mm. Like if you're a grant recipient from one of these large commercial DAF providers, you're getting a letter in the mail with a check and maybe, you know, some contact or a name Uh, you Mm -hmm. know, some sort of dedication Mm -hmm. of the grant. Mm -hmm. Um, We're really allowing for donors and organizations to just skip communicating through us Mm. 
and put their email, put their name, you cool. know, like create a connection with the nonprofit at the time of the grant creation. Yeah. And that's up to the donor. Yeah. Right. That that flexibility being up to the donor is one of the advantages of a donor advised fund. Yeah. And I think, you know, you you mentioned something earlier that I really want to like applaud, mm. um, commend, which is a lot of times for people who are giving the organization wants the relationship and wants somebody who's going to care about the mission mm -hmm. and get into the weeds with them. Totally. And if you're making a one-off donation through mm -hmm. a portal on a website and it's the end of the year and you're scrambling and you're hoping that they take the coin that you have or the alternative asset that you have or the stock that they have a stock giving portal mm -hmm. even, right? Mm -hmm. You're hoping that that's the case and maybe it's not. So you had to go to your second choice organization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? None of that scrambling has to happen with the donor advised fund. Right. And most people think of a donor advised fund like, oh, only if I have some major windfall. Oh, only if I have some big appreciated asset. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of users who just come and give cash, mm -hmm. but they do it because they get to participate and be more engaged with the grant making process mm -hmm. because now it's not a scramble to get the financial thing right and then right. boom the money's gone and it's in the hand of the organization right right it's right. like december 29th no, like, you're sitting there trying to figure out which of the five groups are we going to give to this year and, correct yeah yeah and so now it's more about the original tagline on endowment when i was coding it myself was mm. hello philanthropist you know and it was like kind of this idea it's corny and it's not the tagline now uh, <laughs> but like it's this idea that like a daf basically lets you start your own little family foundation without mm. needing yep. a fan you could have no family yeah and you could it could be the robbie family foundation yep. you know and yep. it could be just you yeah and it can also scale to including your family members and it can also mm -hmm. scale to everything up to until you absolutely have to get a private foundation stood up. And right. then, you know, at that point you're talking tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in grant yeah. making happening before that makes sense. Yeah. And like basically n nobody is that. Right. Right. Very, very few people are giving that much money. Right. And how do you kind of, Say to everybody, like, this is not a function of how much money you have. This is a function of accessibility to tools and a function of personal education. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we make that more approachable? Mm -hmm. Like, isn't that the point of internet based technologies is right. to sort of drop that barrier to entry as far down as you can? Right. And, and so we try to position ourselves yep. in that way. And, and try to sort of develop a business that is reflective of that strategy. Yeah. Right. So you asked about, you know, how do we, how do we sort of structure our business model mm -hmm. around getting money out the door mm -hmm. and teaching people about what it means to put money into a DAF and then grant it out to an organization that they care about. Well, you know, most of the time, if you're going to a DAF, you're putting some assets in and you're getting charged a charitable admin fee. Right. Um, whether that charitable admin fee is, is in the form of AUM basis points charge per quarter based on average balance, or it's a fixed monthly subscription cost, you know, or it's a yearly membership that you pay that gets you access to it. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways for people to structure the incentives around, like, what is the role of the community foundation, mm -hmm. right? And, and so when we, you know, our mission at Endowment is to manage and encourage the charitable giving of assets through emerging technology. Mm -hmm. And we see as one of our core values that we want to see that throughput out to nonprofits and that the concept of sort of benefiting by somebody hanging around rather than benefiting by somebody creating impact mm. is a profound contrast 
for us to differentiate ourselves on right. as a nonprofit. So, so we charge charitable admin fees one time, kind of through a jobs done framework. Mm. It's the way to think about it. So when we do a job for the donor, yeah. we charge for that right. service. Right. So uh, we charge 50 basis points on the way in the door. Mm -hmm. And we charge 100 basis points on the way out the door. Yeah. And people might say, oh, wow. percent and a half. Mm. It's more than the 60 bips that I'm charged at insert big commercial DAF provider here. Mm -hmm. And what actually winds up happening is that over time, because you're getting that 60 bips charged every year, the organization is incentivized, A, for you to sit and do no grant making. Yeah. But also B, like there's no incentive to improve the donor experience mm -hmm. because improving right. the donor experience would just mean more money going out the door. Right, right. And we, when we were designing our model, mm. we, we were like, how do we still wind up with like the same net charge over the lifetime of a donor advised fund mm -hmm. or better while approaching this from a ethically aligned standpoint, from an impact aligned standpoint yeah. of we are rewarded when more impact happens. Mm -hmm. And, and so if you graph it out, if you take the average grant making, if you take the average growth of assets, you look at one, three, five, ten years, mm -hmm. you know, people are winding up paying anywhere from at the low end, like a percent and a half for charitable admin fees over a short two year grant making period, mm. all the way up to four, five, six, seven percent if they take a longer period of time to grant it out. Yeah. And these commercial DAF providers know this. Mm -hmm. They know this and it's led to there being no incentive to improve the overarching user experience of using a DAF. Right. And you feel that when you show up to one of those commercial DAF providers today. Yeah. Where it's your fax and informs. Yeah. You're calling an 800 number. You're, you know sending in a social security number, waiting a couple of days for them to run a compliance check on you, and then your account's open. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the forms look like they're from 2004 because they probably are from 2004. Mm -hmm. And I think the opportunity for there to be a, a new entrant that has different incentives mm -hmm. is part of the broader experimentation that you're seeing across the DAF space. Yep that has become quite competitive over mm -hmm. the last couple of years. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I think in, in that way at dot org, we're really focused on like getting dollars in the door mm -hmm. and getting dollars out the door. Right. And making sure that donors feel that deep connection mm -hmm. so that they come back and they do more giving. Yeah. Because really that feeling of granting it out is what inspires you to give more down the line. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond the underlying tax incentive. And so I think, um, you know, more and more people are looking at their vendors and saying, what is their incentive architecture through right. their business model? Right. And do I believe in it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's interesting. I hope people are, are going to come to that realization. You know, it's so confusing and complicated and there's yeah. so many different, you know, marketing brochures that you have to kind of sift through. But sure. it, it has been a universal theme in our conversations of this agreement that the the basic AUM fee model is not uh, quite aligned in terms of incentives because of what you described. It incentivizes DAFs to hold on to the capital and worse, not even improve the systems to get the money out the door because right. they make their money through growth and they're great DAF providers who acknowledge this have to live with it and then manage that culturally through their team saying, well, we're here to get the money out the door. Yes, that's not always within our best interests, but that's why we're here. That's why we work here. And I see it more from the nonprofit, you know, kind of true nonprofit DAFs. And, you know, we haven't talked to some of the, the larger corporates, but you can kind of see from the experience that they're making money from the small basis points the accrual of AUM and the funds that you're actually investing those those dollars into, which kind of 
segues into the dot tech side of your sure, your yeah. business and and I I'm very excited because to me like there's so much opportunity within the grant making and the prize is the other 95% of capital which is in the endowments in the investments in the for profit infrastructure of stock and bond portfolios for the most part mm-hmm. um that is reinforcing and essentially in the business as usual economy, right? We're, we're on one side saying, you know, save the whales from deep oil mining and the other side investing in oil and gas at a 10 or 20 to one disproportionate rate within philanthropy, right? So clearly we have a lot of work to do in how do we invest these special treatment tax exempt assets. And that's where I see, um, I feel as a donor, uh, like the feature sets are not very good. The experience is not very good. I mean, I remember calling around a whole bunch of different DAF providers and financial institutions and saying, well, can I invest in this? Can I invest in that? And I swear to you, eight, nine times out of 10, the answer was no, but we have this fund, which was powered by BlackRock. (laughs) <laughs> right? like, it was like all roads led back to like putting my mon- money only in BlackRock funds. Yep. And there was just a, a, a kind of a limited amount of options. So what you're describing to me resonates 100%, which is the compliance architecture, which has to be there because we're talking about tax exempt funds. I mean, otherwise this would be going into tax money, right? Mm-hmm. So we have a higher degree of, of compliance standards we have to adhere to. But what is that potential for ethical investing, for impact investing, for socially responsible investing? And and what how does that uh, start to converge with this on chain digitally native environment? You know, I think that when you look at a DAF, when you think personally about your DAF, maybe it's it's kind of it's like your ethical financial home, right? right? It's the place where you are reflecting your hopes for society beyond your own personal gain. Right. right. You've put money aside for giving it away to nonprofits to try and see the world become a better place. And the dissonance that you feel in choosing between six marked up in house brokerage ETFs right. that are investing in the same 1,000 companies that everybody else is investing in, right. it feels like a missed opportunity. And you can certainly give users the full fire hose. We've seen people kind of turn on the fire hose and say, pick whatever you want, mm. right? Like you can pick from any of these ETFs. Here's 400 and some odd ETFs that you can pick from. Mm-hmm. But again, like the curatorial experience matters here. Mm-hmm. And the relationship between the, the charity the platform that the charity is using to power its services, the donor and its advisor or its sort of companion or colleague in executing a portfolio strategy mm-hmm. all have to work in concert. And what is exciting about what we're doing on this front, especially, is that as a function of being comfortable with alternative assets, as a function of our emergent expertise and complex donations, we've gotten really close to a number of different custodians who are registered investment advisors, who are working in a number of very exciting different investment veins, Mm. is what I'll call it. And because we have that familiarity with custodians, it's very easy for us to say to a donor, you have investing goals for your own primary account. And when you give from that primary account to the DAF account, you want to make sure some of that thesis stays Mm -hmm. contiguous between the two profiles, Mm -hmm. between the two portfolios. Mm -hmm. And that continuity of care is important in financial services in the same way as it is important in, say, healthcare services, Mm -hmm. right? And and so for people to kind of be making this ethical decision to give away 
and then being given so few options mm. actually winds up discouraging the giving itself. Right. And so what we say is, hey, you have a wealth advisor, you have uh, uh, a wealth manager of some sort, and they're managing your primary assets. You know, we'll become a customer of them. We'll sign up with their custodian. Mm. We'll sign up as a customer of their financial advisory. And we'll open an account that is FBO, the DAF that you have at endowment. Right. And we'll work together with the wealth advisor to make sure that some of those same principles that you've been implementing in your primary portfolio mm. are being mirrored into your DAF portfolio. Mm. Or maybe even accentuated. Right. Right? Like that you would want to go harder towards your goals from an ethical perspective. Right. With your donor advised fund account. Yeah, And the challenge is making sure that the charity has a relationship with a RIA who's looking after the prudent management of those assets. Mm. But more and more, what we're learning is that prudent management is impact investment. Mm -hmm. And to be able to sort of break down that barrier of saying, you don't need to have $5 million, you don't need to have $500,000 or even $100,000 in a DAF mm -hmm. to have your wealth advisor creating a continuity of care between your, the DAF that you've opened and advise at endowment and your primary personal assets. Okay. And I think that's, that's one of those things that you can really only do because we're starting from the ground up. Because we can do things that don't scale right now yeah. super well and start to build the tooling around them so that they do scale over time as we grow. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also something that runs directly counter to the sort of traditional entity architecture of donor advised funds being like an offshoot of a broker dealer, mm -hmm. right? So if a broker dealer only has certain av available investment options, they're not going to let their DAF provider go outside of those available investment options because that kills the whole point of opening the DAF as a spinoff of the broker dealer in the first place, right. right? So what they say instead is, you know, here's the things that we can provide you. Exactly. But when you have a custodian agnostic donor advised fund provider mm. that is very comfortable and very flexible around alternative investing, mm -hmm. you wind up being able to have a more powerful donor advised fund that can do in concert with an RIA who's already assisting with the main profile, help with the secondary DAF profile mm -hmm. being in line with the ethics of the main investment portfolio or right. even more advanced than that. So, so, so what I hear you, cool what I hear you, and I, I want to make sure we didn't lose people because there's, there's a lot of different terms and layers here, but it, what I hear you saying is I can essentially take the money that I'm storing in my endowment account for now in investments and I can choose a wealth advisor and they're going to do the custodianship as well, or will it still stay endowment custodied? And then essentially now I can work with them to customize this portfolio to reflect my values and, and my aspirations. And when you open up the universe of wealth advisors, then you open up you know, a, a much larger spectrum of possible investing approaches rather than just saying, here's your three pools that you can choose from. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. You know, what I'll say is normally you have to hit a certain balance threshold in order to be able to bring your wealth advisor with you right. to create that continuity of care. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that should be open to everyone. Mm -hmm. That if you're already working with somebody around your values when it comes to investing with your just for your own benefit mm -hmm. account, yep. that in the space where you're doing your ethical investing, mm -hmm. maybe, or you're doing your, your sort of reflection of your deeper altruistic self mm -hmm. that you should also have that same sort of customizability yeah. um, without, without having to make some overcommitment or, or make the improper financial decision for yourself. Right. So we think that's going to be pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, most people open DAFs with their wealth advisors advice that yeah. like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And a lot of those wealth advisors are basically saying goodbye to the assets under management when they get donated because they go into 
the DAF system. Right. And the DAF system is siloed from their management structure and their management piece. Got it. And so it also becomes this equation of incentive alignment between yep. this, this little community yep. and how we want to try and make for better outcomes, both while the money is being invested, mm. before it's donated, mm -hmm. after it's donated, and when it gets granted out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you kind of pivoting the conversation a bit, but it's a segue really to crypto. Do you imagine a world where people are going to be in, able to invest the funds self-directed into a variety of different tokenized assets? Already here. Already here. We don't have to imagine such a future. Okay, tell um, me more we about have, this. We have about six different on-chain investment opportunities, depending on what chain you're coming to us from. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you're just a social user, you're getting, um, uh, like, like if you're logging in with your email or you're logging in with your Google account or, you know, mm. your, your Apple account or whatever, you're getting our uh, optimism deployment. And um, so for most people, they come in and they'll see Aave, uh, mm -hmm. Compound. Um, they'll see ETH and staked ETH mm. and Bitcoin. Got it. Um, all native on-chain investment. Um, not, yeah. not, well, for Bitcoin, it's wrapped because we're based off Ethereum. Um, but, you know, for ETH and staked ETH, we're working with leading protocols. Uh, Aave and Compound are canonical deployments yep. for earning interest against stable coins, against US dollar-backed stable coins. Yep. Uh, and that, investment set is growing all the time. And, and what is that investment set going to look like with time? Are you taking uh, any sort of compliance risk that would require you to really vet the long tail of ERC-20s and tokens um, so that you're not going to just kind of open this up like a Uniswap per se? Um, or is it possible that we get to a world where I start my DAF and then I can move my funds into you know, one of millions of different types of tokens. We do have an investment policy and a specific subsection of it that's dedicated to digital assets and what we're willing to hold as mm. a sort of broader reflection of the entire ecosystem. Mm. So, you know, our board of directors has to approve every investment policy or the investment committee that mm -hmm. sits below it has to approve every investment opportunity that we put into the application that's available to all DAFs. Got it. And the regulation that we have to follow is called a MIPFA. It's about in, Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act. Right. Um, and, you know, that, that legislation is, was designed to be left intentionally vague, mm -hmm. um, but really says, you know, you have to use commonly accepted portfolio management theory in order to hold institutional funds mm. um, because these aren't funds that belong to a user, right? right? These are funds that belong to endowment that have been donated irrevocably to endowment. Right. So, you know, we do have a system for mitigating risk and it's mm. not like you can go and swap into anything right. with your DAF assets, except if you give us an instruction mm. about how we should hold it. So I think donors have more power than they realize. Yeah. Um, they just have to articulate that power, mm -hmm. express that power at the moment they donate as right. a condition of the donation. Right. So a donor could approach us and say, hey, you know, I want this held as is for X number of years, liquidated on this schedule. Mm. And we either say, no, thank you. We're not doing that. But most of the time we say, oh, that's pretty rad. You know, yeah. like we'll draw up a gift agreement and we'll do it. Um, mm -hmm. because we want the charitable giving to happen. Right. And they have a strongly held opinion about the potential of a given asset that they've donated. Right. Um, so that's something that most DAF providers won't do mm -hmm. because, again, they don't have the custodial relationships. Totally. Right? They don't have that agnosticism to what they're taking in. Yeah. And that's been a unique niche for us to sort of exploit. Yeah. And oftentimes we come in People find us because they're in a scenario where they want to give something special yeah. and they want it to be handled in a special way. Yeah. And, and so that gives us more flexibility than just the options that are available to everybody once you've already donated. Got it. Um, but I, I guess yeah. where, where I get excited where this, I mean, this is maybe not so short term, but 
to me, the, the notion of, of bringing the funds into a wider set of wealth advisors and then where we're then directing the portfolio and maybe doing some private placement funds and some more boutique stuff is a great step forward. You know, I'd rather not just be told I need S&P conservative mix, S&P moderate mix, S&P aggressive mix, like, or S&P minus a couple bad companies. Like, I'd rather have a more, uh, <laughs> you know, wider set of investment options because I'm not happy with the S&P and the ethics of business as usual, right? So that's step one. But I think step two is like, as the world becomes tokenized, as we start to see more and more blended financial mechanisms being represented in tokens, whether that's uh, something that's happening in my local community, maybe it's a bioregional financing facility that's tokenized. You know, we've talked to a number of folks, including Samantha Power, about the emergence of these kinds of what are being called BFFs, bioregional financing facilities. That could be tokenized. You know, I could be saying, hey, I want to make sure that my capital is going into regenerative projects in my watershed, in my bioregion. And so if that becomes possible, and so those tokens are ERC-20s being traded across the DeFi landscape um, and can make it through the prudent management threshold barriers, because yes, of course, you know, there's some compliance required. Um, now, all of a sudden, we're democratizing the creation of new classes of financial instruments we're accelerating the pace in which we can see this experimentation and velocity on chain. And that's also going to have a pulling effect of more dollars being donated because people have more confidence that, yes, this is not just about giving away, away all the money like that, but it's also about ethical investing and maximizing the amount of impact we can have through ethical investing right. through the tax incentives. You know, regenerative economies are both ancient and a brand new concept at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right, like living in reciprocity with the earth is mm -hmm. um, ancestral wisdom mm -hmm. that we would all be well served to be better in touch with. Well said. And a lot of these new concepts are are many levels up the beanstalk. Mm -hmm. You know, very like 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 way up there in the clouds. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of interest to be experimenting with these kinds of offerings. Mm -hmm. And the question is, would you rather do it in a tax-free environment where the money's already given? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a risk-on environment in the first place. Right. Right, because you're never getting this money back. Yep. And it's already committed to, to philanthropy. So are you willing to take slightly worse terms or slightly higher risk around the success of the investment but knowing that the societal impact is also a piece of the puzzle for you, mm -hmm. the DAF is the perfect vehicle for that. 100%. Right? And it seems so backwards that the investment option set is so restrictive yep. um, or so gated to very large donors mm -hmm. to do that more creative kind of financing. And I think what is exciting about tokenizing these kinds of regenerative economies is that it's just like flipping a switch for us to turn on regen token as an investment option in yeah. our in our donor advised fund model. It just has to meet those prudent management options right. and there has to be sufficient demand and liquidity for it. Right. But you get those like those things are not trivial, but they're achievable. Yeah. And all of a sudden now a coalition of you know, eight figures of DAF capital as it stands today and, you know, exactly. growing is now able to access this right. investment opportunity that maybe they wouldn't have touched with the main, with the main position set. Yeah, I, I imagine a world where we have reforestation tokens, we have conservation easement tokens, we have, you know, different sorts of ocean marine preservation you know, and, and we can blend for-profit, non-profit incentives and carbon offtakes and, you know, different forms of emerging climate finance to make these things make sense where maybe this one's a target positive 5% per annum and this one's, an, you know, a, a minus 5% per annum. But it's not just a binary, you've given it all away or you're growing it for maximum. Like only getting those two options as our financial paradigm is so silly. Like there's so much in-between space that can be applied more intelligently 
so that we can align incentives towards the aims that we're trying to achieve. The money is, you know, in service to our aims. Um, so yeah, I, I just think the on-chain economy is is kind of the transformational, you know, zero to one game-changing infrastructure. And it would be scary if we were having this conversation about, oh, well, we have all this new flexibility now in these tax-exempt structures. If it wasn't accompanied also with a degree of transparency and precision, yeah. right? And this is, I think, a common critique that you probably hear as well of like, it's kind of scary to hear that the billionaires are using all these weird foundation structures to achieve their personal aims and mixing it with their for-profit interests and da da da. Like, I'm scared about that because you don't know what they're doing. And so, yeah, tell me a bit more about what is the transparency and the shining of the light that the mm-hmm. on-chain economy is going to offer? Well, first off, there's no donor advice fund provider out there that can be independently audited by a third party without any permission from the donor advice fund provider, mm. except for endowment. Every single one of our donor advice funds is a smart contract address on a publicly available and auditable blockchain. Mm-hmm. And there's something really powerful about especially in a world of pledges and big commitments to philanthropy that you hear about getting walked back. There's Mm. something very powerful about having the receipt. Yeah. And (laughs) right. Like, and, and whether that receipt is, Hey, where's the money that I donated and what's Mm. it being invested in? And can you show me that it's in the vault that I articulated it should be held in? Whether that vault is a traditional investment or wrap Bitcoin or Mm. the DPI or, uh, the regen token, right? Mm. Like what, what, you know, or some set of alternatives or, you know, um, yeah. whatever it is that you've packaged up for mm-hmm. your DAF, you want to be able to verify it. Right. Um, and I think in general, transparency and willingness to talk about the underlying incentive architecture mm. is becoming table stakes for consumers. And by being on chain, we introduce a level of transparency that is beyond just voluntary reporting. Mm -hmm. That is an open platform for anybody to come and audit what we're doing and what we say we're doing Mm -hmm. and the people we say we're paying, paying and the investments we say we're making. And I think that the 990 is great but it only goes to a certain level of fidelity. Mm. And, you know, people have found ways to hide their giving through shell after shell after shell of totally. donor advised funds or passing things around. And we kind of want to open up the fire hose a little bit on that data and mm. say, you know, this is, this is what it means to, to really showcase where the money is. Right. Um, I also think that to a certain degree, there's still an incredible amount of trust embedded in philanthropic transactions Mm -hmm. and the presence of a trustless protocol actually kind of like makes things sometimes more complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we had a scenario where an anonymous developer team made a large grant to the committee to protect journalists. And the CPJ is like, where is this coming from? And it was crowdfunded, right? So it's all like, wow. it was like a big mint that resulted in, you know, a high six figure grant, right? So big chunk of change for, for the CPJ, like not not a, a something to sneeze at for, yeah. for for them and their budget and there's a group distributed group of anonymous individuals who are making this gift and like is that ethically aligned mm. and so i think in some ways like it's one of those situations where the technology gives us a new toy to play with that maybe we haven't quite Mm-hmm. all the way figured out. We spend a lot of time thinking about like experiments in impact attestations. Yeah, great. Like, oh my gosh, you and I can go on about this. We need another <laughs> hour. Yeah. Um, we think a lot about like 
how do we connect the dots between a transaction or thousands of transactions mm. and the outcome that's generated from them? Yeah. And I'm hopeful that we'll get to a space where the like overarching fundamentals of the business are such that we can go off right, and right, do more right. experimentation in that space. Yeah. But we also like to like fund through grants people who are doing interesting work around impact attestations because really just us providing the receipts is like good, mm. but there's so much deeper transparency work to be done that yep. is enabled by the tool set. Yep. And even things like, you know, public thank you notes to donors about you gave us a hundred dollars and we turned it into nine medical kits. Right. Here's a picture of the nine medical kits and a receipt and we hashed it. We threw it on chain, and now your wallet is forever credited with those nine medical kits. And how do you build a reputation score, or how do you mm. understand the actions of a family foundation that's making huge number of grants through an open source observer of on chain activity from that donor advised fund, mm -hmm. and start to draw patterns and understand, like, at a deeper level, what's happening mm -hmm. with a very influential philanthropist. And mm -hmm. I think more and more people are going to want to offer that transparency and more and more people are going to come to expect it of the provider yeah. that they're using. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things that's like, that's the benefit of being on chain is that we have mm -hmm. this heightened level of transparency that most people won't bother to go into Etherscan and look through all of our contract addresses or, you know, optimism scan or, or base scan or whatever. Right. And look through all of our contract addresses. But like, nonetheless, we have direct connection with those platforms to label every contract address. Yeah. So that if you're going through it with your financial advisors, like, Hey, can you send me the transaction where you donated mm. this much money to your donor advised fund? Like I need mm -hmm. a record of it. Yeah. Right. They go and they grab the receipt and it's all nicely formatted, labeled up, ready totally. for them to go. But, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of work still to be done totally. around that last mile of like, okay, the money has left us. We sent it to the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. What happened to it? And that's where totally. we see impact that cessations playing a role and other kinds of like downstream application development beyond just the core financial use case. But yeah. really endowment is kind of out there enough as it is just yeah. by being an on-chain grant management totally. system and fund management system totally. that like, Baby steps. That's yeah, kind of like that's kind of well, what I want we're to say. working. We're working with Hulk Abramer from Hypersearch oh, cool. on some experiments in this area because that's yeah, awesome. we we are excited as well about this. You know, protocols to essentially enshrine impact certificates in a right. way that can yep. you know really start to create more confidence, traceability, verifiability about outcomes, and that will create kind of network effects and incentives for. Nonprofits to be able to report their impact in specific ways. That's essentially creating a, a interoperable languages where all these different types of systems can come together. And you know, you mentioned the um, most people wouldn't necessarily go through their ether scans or their opt scans and so forth. And I mean, I I have a lot of words to share about how the UX of crypto needs to be improved. And I will say, like my tax and portfolio systems around crypto now are starting to be able to just ingest all of my wallet addresses and give me way better reporting and information yep. than what I can do across my financial accounts in the traditional system. And we're, you know, 2024, we're still early days and it's already getting quite good, right? So we're, I think we're at the cusp of, of some tremendous new potential. You know, I think there, there's a number of different things that I, mm. I, I want to touch on from what you just said. First and foremost, if you're a coin tracker user and you use endowment, all of those transactions automatically get flagged as, donat as donations. Awesome. Com something completely not achievable. Awesome. Right, 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 right. In any other... Right, right. We're exporting my Wells yeah. Fargo statements no. out. <laughs> Absolute nightmare, right, right? Right, And, you know, you're building the 8949. You're hoping you don't miss the, right, the donation, right, right, right. right? So that's one thing. I think, too, you know, we talked about the Internet's Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we think about how do we take the the sort of primitives of a community foundation, mm -hmm. move them into a more transparent environment. Yeah. And to me, impact attestations is the primitive of a thank you letter. Right. Right. And so uh, to me, what is most exciting about some of the hyper search stuff that yeah. um, we've been thinking about mm. is 
there are lots of people thinking about the really high theory, high concept hyper certs that you could that yeah. you could issue. Yeah. I'm thinking about the low concept, you know, idiot proof yeah. hyper cert. Yeah. And people are like, oh, I get it. Yeah. I got a little certificate for right, right. you know, a thank you certificate. Totally. I got a thank you cert. Right. Yeah. And like, yeah. And and so I think um that that's one of those primitives that we could think about porting over. Yeah. The other primitive that we are spending a lot of time thinking about porting over mm. is governance and membership. Tell me more. So like in a nonprofit, there are directors, there are officers, there are members. Mm. Um, oftentimes the membership is powered by dues. You know, you pay some small fee. Um, Sometimes members, they're just sole memberships because the membership isn't as important mm -hmm. at that time or that stage in the organization, mm -hmm. or they choose to be controlled by a very small number of people for a wide number of reasons that are not always nefarious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've, because we were just getting our start, have started with a very, very small membership, mm -hmm. a very, very small board of directors just to try and get this thing off the ground. Uh, and now we're hitting this stage where it's like, it's like, okay, like we're turning four. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it's probably time to like open this up and have the oversight apparatus also become part of that transparency, not just the asset management and fund allocation, mm -hmm. which has been from day zero, part of the transparency equation. But right. now what about the actual corporate governance? Right. And so we've cool. been thinking a lot about like tokenizing membership, cool. which is cool. Yeah. We haven't seen anybody really do that with yeah. a 501c3 yet with a public charity. Nice. Um, so stay tuned on that front. Nice. Um, you know, I think those are just some examples of the primitives that can get transferred from, oh, I got, you know, a snail mail letter from my grant recipient saying thank you. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I opened a DAF, so now I'm a member at this community foundation to saying, Oh, like, can we actually use tokens as incentivization for better DAF management, for better mm. behavior amongst philanthropists? Can we yeah. think of hypercerts as an a, as a vehicle for giving reputation in the same moment where you say thank you and build a relationship between um, a, a nonprofit and a donor? So, right, yeah, I mean, you're totally right. We're just starting to scratch the surface, totally. and in so many ways, we think of endowment as trying to be a very approachable version of a lot of these big high concept technologies yeah and because giving is such like a personal mm -hmm. it's something everybody does you know like yeah. we i i was fortunate enough a couple of years back to get a breakfast with some senators and you know we mm -hmm. were going around the room talking about what each of our businesses do and you know everybody's doing l2s or MEV, you know, protection or automated market making, you know, big ideas, right? Big, heavy academic ideas. And you can see the sort of legislators like being like, what, you know? Right. And then uh, it comes around to us and we're like, we're endowment, we're a community foundation. They go, I, you know, I support a community <laughs> foundation. I have a yeah. donor advised fund, right. right? So in many ways we see on-chain giving as an opportunity to help crypto cross the chasm. Yeah from being just for really early adopters who are doing that more on-chain investing, who are mm -hmm. there for the long tail of donated assets yep. to being like, okay, what are the real user benefits yep. of developing a fully transparent, you know, trustless community foundation mm -hmm. that anybody can come and interact with? Mm -hmm. And what does that actually mean for the outcomes from a philanthropic standpoint, not about the underlying technology that powers it, but like totally. the way the community becomes a better place, yeah. the way that people wind up engaging more with giving, mm -hmm. you know, the way that they feel more connected to their own philanthropy or feel more connected to their family and, you know, the way that they're making their community a better place. And I think right. those things are much more legible. Yeah for the average person. And totally. that's why we like to kind of stay at the base of the beanstalk, as, as I like to say. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree and, and resonate more with, with how you guys are approaching it and just and really appreciative that 
you are tackling it from the giving donation purposeful you know type of of economy because yeah like you said there are a lot of people working on other parts of the stack and i think it makes sense that crypto is penetrating through financial use cases first and payments and store value you know two very common base of the beanstalk types of use cases well giving generosity how we engage with our community is another one of those there's not a lot of experiments happening in this area relative to the field at large. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been watching you from the sidelines and just impressed at how many different experiments. One of those I did want to just quickly touch on. I know we're running late, but um, you've been one of the only ones also doing kind of unique things around quadratic funding using Gitcoin's oh, sure, APIs. Yeah. Um, we're about to run a quadratic funding round. When this airs, cool. people can go to modelers.com slash grants and see kind of what we're up to. It'll be our okay. second uh, quadratic funding round. But yeah, just maybe share a little bit more about what you've learned in that space and how that fits into endowment. So for the, for the uninitiated, yeah. uh, <laughs> quad <laughs> quadratic funding is a different way of allocating matching funds. It's, um, it's a methodology by which you look at both the size of the donation that mm. has come in and the number of individual donors to determine the size of the match that should come from a central matching pool. Right. And this is taken off in the crypto world and popularized primarily by, by, by Gitcoin, who yep. developed the, the technology and the protocol in the first place. Yep. Um, and, you know, it, it was one of those scenarios where it's like work with the people you look up to, yeah. you know, like kind of, kind of cool. Um, yeah. You know, we've been following Gitcoin from, you know, before endowment existed because it's been around since before endowment existed and are just really inspired about like what it means to experiment with allocation of community dollars. Mm -hmm. And so we reached out to Gitcoin. We were participating in their community. You know, we were becoming close with them and we started talking about like, okay, what is the community allocation opportunity? at a community foundation, right? Um, Gitcoin itself focuses on public goods. So like things that otherwise don't get funding because they don't necessarily have the sort of unit economics to get funding, yeah. but they're infrastructurally critical, yeah. right? We're doing something kind of different. We're doing tax exempt giving, right? Mm. So it's, we're, we're, we're doing philanthropy. We're doing give to nonprofits, mm. which generally have a slightly different business model than public goods. I, I think some... Most nonprofits are probably public goods. There's like a big debate about what what's a public good. Yeah. Um, but regardless, you know, we we, we kind of looked at the technology and said, like, what is the opportunity for us to differentiate our DAF provider through novel matching mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Basically, what we said is the grant making activity that's happening across all, you know, we have something like 680 plus donor advised funds mm -hmm. right now. And there are making grants all over the world. We support grant making over 150 countries. Mm -hmm. And that is an active curatorial effort by the masses that is happening permissionlessly based on people's interests. Right. And so we said, what if we took all of that activity and used it as the curational force for a matching pool? Mm -hmm and applied the quadratic matching algorithm, which basically says how much did somebody give and how many people gave, mm -hmm. and use that to determine how we distribute matching funds. Right. And that's been really cool because now we have like this pulse mm. of who's getting grassroots support right. across endowment. Right. And then they're getting every quarter, they're getting a little bonus grant. Right. Because they're doing their fundraising on endowment. So it's like, it's a virtuous cycle a little bit. Yeah. Right. But beyond that, you know, the, the next question everybody asks is like, where does the money come from? Right. Right. And, and that was another unique opportunity with our adaptation of quadratic matching, which is to seed the uh, matching pool itself, to seed mm -hmm. the pool of funds that is making these distributions based on the grassroots support across the entire community. Yeah. We are asking our largest donors. Right to fund that matching pool exactly so that they relinquish some of the grant making decisions to the wisdom of masses exactly and 
we even went like a step further. We didn't really stop there, <laughs> which is fun. So we asked all the big donors. They gave like the, the big principal chunk. But now we've actually incorporated it into our policies as well. Yep. So big criticism of DAFs is people come, take the big tax deduction. Park the money. Park the money and see you later. Yeah. And we were like, you know, some, most DAF providers have like an inactive policy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we decided to incorporate this quadratic matching pool into our inactive policy. So basically, the destination for inactive funds mm -hmm. is now this matching pool. Right. So if you, if you come in, make a big donation and bail, yep. we're going to start after a period of years, you know, this yeah. isn't like you got to give it all away tomorrow, yeah. but a, a, over a period of, after a period of years of, a, uh, of inactivity, mm. we'll start slowly taking the balance of the inactive donor advice funds and add them to the matching pool, yeah. which keeps this perpetual philanthropy machine running. Mm. And addresses a huge criticism of, of DAFs death. to say like, don't worry, if you want to ditch, right. that's fine. Our community's got your back right? and is going to make the allocation decision. It's brilliant. I mean, you're putting so many pieces together in it's novel fun. ways. It's super fun. And I mean, it, just to re recap how I understand what you're saying and what I experienced when I went through the, the on-chain you know, uh, website experience was, you know, essentially, if I park my my funds in the DAF and don't use them, you're going to start putting them in the matching pool. You're also getting other big donors to put funds in the matching pool. That matching pool divorces kind of some of the, the decision-making about who to support right. and how much to support them. But it's, it's a wisdom of the crowds approach where kind of like traditional philanthropy, where we did matching pools to go encourage community donations. Right. But now we have an even more, literally exponential formula underneath it that is yes. recognizing the breadth of the community support yeah. for those different nonprofits. And what I would give a particular plug to is to the nonprofit community saying, hey, right. go start fundraising. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Through endowment because you can start to get things from the matching pool. And even though we're early days and small amounts each quarter, like that's just free donations that can come to you by putting your... Uh, community donations through your system. You know, we're seeing organizations that raise a couple hundred dollars getting a couple thousand dollars in matching and because it comes from a wide group of people. Right. And then we see organizations that get a million dollar one-time grant getting the minimum. Yeah, get a hundred bucks or get something. Get a hundred bucks. Right, right. Right, and that's... That's the beauty of QF. That's yep. the beauty of quadratic matching, of quadratic yep. funding, yep. is that it inverts the power equation yep. and encourages widespread adoption of mm. the new technology because it's, it's a function of how many people you activate. Yep. And so we actually see nonprofits who have switched their fundamental like core fundraising mechanism to endowment because they're getting so much bonus from the matching pool. Yeah. Now, is that a Sybil attack? Is that right? Is that an abuse of the system? We spend a lot of time making sure that, like, yeah. if it's the same person that's making the same yeah. little tiny gift, you know, we're combining yeah, yeah, yeah. those into one gift. Yeah. Right. We're doing a lot of controls against that, and that's yeah. part of the learning process. Totally. Um, Sorry, not to take it to yeah. a too technical no, place. It, but, there, yeah, there's still a lot know. of these things to work out. And Gitcoin continues to pioneer great fraud tools in the back end. We yeah. used those in our first round. We saw how it helped to equalize the results in a, in a way that was healthy. And yeah, I mean, people ask me, like, why are you so excited about crypto? And this conversation exemplifies, like, there, there's so much possible. You know, you and I just met. We just start talking, finding new interests and like, we're, this is also the power of what Vitalik brought to us with Ethereum, you know, and, yeah. and also he was a co-author on the quadratic funding paper originally with Glenn Weil and Zoe Hitzig. What Ethereum and other blockchains do is they create this environment where you're experimenting with stuff. Kevin and Gitcoin's experimenting yeah. with stuff. We start to experiment, use tools, learn from it. You know, everyone starts to essentially be able to evolve these systems more in tandem because we're sharing, you know, common language and common infrastructure. No, it's, it's so true. You know, like another shout out to another project doing QF, amazing QF experimentation is, is Giveth. 
Yep. Which, yeah, yeah, we had a we had a great conversation with Griff Green last year. Really? Year. Yeah, yeah. He wore a Santa Claus hat and everything. He's the man. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you know, it's such a small community of people who are doing this kind of work. Yeah. And I think what I love most about it is like we're each trying to add something different to the mix. Yeah. You know, like our focus on tax exemption and on donor advised funds is very, very different from mm. the work that Giveth is doing around bootstrapping regen economies mm -hmm. and helping crowdfund projects versus the quadratic matching and allocation work that mm -hmm. Gitcoin is doing or that Octon is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's all sorts of projects on Cello, and we see Cello sort of exploding as like this mm -hmm. platform for these kinds of regenerative experiments. And so, you know, endowment is really just a small piece of this. And, and what's cool is that because of the way the system works, it's not a question of competing with each other over the pie. It's a question of interoperability with each other right. to increase exposure. Right. So that's why we integrate in Allo. That's why mm -hmm. Giveth has integrated every single endowment organization that's been claimed is available to be given to on Giveth because they mm -hmm. have a different incentive architecture yep. for making gifts. Um, and I think you're seeing an emergent community of builders who are doing things differently mm -hmm. because the tools are letting them express their values through their creation. Mm -hmm. and um yeah it's really such a privilege it's 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 a dream job um hard job yeah yeah and two jobs it sounds like two uh, jobs hard <laughs> jobs um but there's no um laying awake at night wondering if what you're doing is helping people right or mm. if it's work of consequence yeah um and that's been something that just at least on a personal level i've been really searching for and mm. has been one of the biggest value propositions of doing this work. Robbie Heger, thank you so much. Appreciate oh, it. People can go to endowment.org, E-N-D-A-O-M-E-N-T.org, set up your donor advised fund, get interested in this on-chain uh, internet community fund. Um, if you heard all the sirens, that's because we are live in New York for New York Climate Week. And so we'll continue to release episodes as quickly as we can from an, an amazing myriad number of conversations that we're having here this week. Uh, you can find all of those and more at maearth.com. Don't forget to follow, share, subscribe. And, uh, you know, if you've made it this far, you must be somewhat intrigued and interested in crypto. We're also going to be doing a number of conversations at DevCon. So stay tuned for that as well. Uh, thanks for being on the journey. We'll see you next time. Thank you.